Ready? Okay. It's good to be back in church. Yes. Yes. Uh, just remind you all to maintain your social distance. You can love each other. Love goes a mile ahead, so you don't have to be right up on each person. Uh, just thank you all for coming out today. Uh, as far as announcements, this is our first time back. We're doing things a little differently. If someone makes a mistake, pretend you didn't see it, we'll just keep going, okay? Uh, Announcement-wise, uh, we have hired, or excuse me, made the offer to Elena Vargas for our new, our new sec that, church secretary, and we expect her to start Wednesday. So if you get a strange voice on the phone when you call, introduce yourself, and uh, really can't say too much more about it. She seems to be a rather mature individual, and... Definitely has the job skills, so we'll see where things go. Give her a couple of days to get acclimated, and I'm sure by the end of the week she'll know everybody, right? <laughs> I, that's all the announcements I have, so I'm going to ask Kim to come and do our minute permission. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all here. I'm here to talk about uh, one of the four offerings that the Presbyterian Church does each year, and this is the Peace and Global Witness Offering. Uh, today is the final day to give, but I'm sure if you can give after, um, they would accept it. Um, I want to talk about that congregations of many denominations extend the peace of Christ with a blessing during their service. The peace of Christ be with you. Also also with, with you. you. Thank you. It is a blessing offered and a blessing returned in kind. The peace of Christ is part of what our faith offers to us. Extending the peace of Christ is part of an active, engaged faith, a witness to what it means for us to be building the household of God. In God's house, there are people of every background. In God's house, there are people of every race, age, and gender. In God's house, people who are different from each other in almost every way live together and seek ways to bring about Christ's peace in every part of our lives. We speak out and claim the truth in 2 Colossians. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in all ways. In our church gatherings, we practice offering Christ's peace, trusting that the blessing offered will also be returned. On World Communion Sunday, today, we celebrate that Christ's peace extends throughout all creation. We celebrate that we are all together at the table in God's house. We celebrate that we are offered what we need to continue the work of building the household of God with active peacemakers here at home and around the world. We take action today by offering a blessing of our own. Through our participation in the Peace and Global Witness Offering, our church is extending Christ's peace throughout our community. 25% of the gifts received will stay right here at our church to build, get, build God's house alongside Kanapaha Presbyterian Church. 25% will support regional efforts in our mid-councils and 50% will go to the Presbyterian Mission Agency for its ministry of education and partnership with active peacemakers all around the world. Peacemakers in places like Cameroon, where violence and conflict threaten, peacemakers providing ministries of reconciliation inside prison walls, and peacemakers seeking to eradicate diseases like HIV AIDS and their impacts on the most vulnerable, all gather with us at the table in God's house and greet us saying, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please give generously. If you wish to give, uh, if you're going to write a check, please put in the memo line that it's for the peace offering and that our, our lovely treasurer will know how to account for it. Thank you very much. We didn't plan this, but with one of you ringing the bell, we have not been able to do that for a while. <laughs> Sorry, your brother's faster than you. <laughs> you can ring the bell, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We 
haven't been able to do that for several weeks. But it's, it's good to know that we are still coming together, and that bell means a lot to a lot of folks, I know. Let us open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming back together, of seeing friendly faces and knowing that those who aren't with us physically are with us in spirit. As we celebrate World Communion Sunday, Lord, help us to truly look at ourselves and each other and our efforts to promote your gospel to this world and the unity that you've called us to come into. And you told us to be unified as you and your Father are one. And Lord, we strive to do that this day. Help us, Lord, to continue. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, for all that you are to us and all that you continue to do on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for the lovely weather and the nice break. And Lord, we thank you, too, for the sunshine that will come back. We ask now, Lord, that you be with us as we come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Good morning. It is good to see more than our usual three faces. <laughs> our call to worship is Psalm 19, verses 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. This is our call to confession. The Lord's law is indeed perfect. God decrees sure and precepts right. Yet in our sin and finitude, we fall short and fail to follow God's commandments. Nonetheless, the Lord is gracious, merciful, and abounding in steadfast love. Confident that God's promises are sure, God's character unchanging, we dare to confess our sin in order that we might be forgiven from the past we cannot change and freed for God's good future. Let us pray. This is the prayer of confession. Lord, as we prepare to break the bread and drink from the cup, we cannot help but hesitate to partake of your body and blood. We remember your admonishment to go and be reconciled to our siblings before coming to your table. We recognize how we have fanned the flames of division rather than repair the breach between us. We know we do not make evident our unity in you, our oneness made possible through your sacrifice. Too many of your children do not have a place at the table, do not have enough to eat, are relegated to beg for crumbs when you command us to offer radical and abundant hospitality. In your relentless mercy, forgive us, free us from fear, and make us conduits for your reconciling love. Take time for silent personal confession. people said. Amen. God refuses to give up on us. God restores us. God sent the only, the only Son to save us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, believe the good news. Through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Join me in 
in the prayer of illumination uh, printed on your bulletin or on your screen at home. Thank you. Your law, O oh Lord, is perfect. Your commandments clear. Your decrees sure. You do not leave us in the dark to guess your will, but instead send the light no darkness can overcome to reveal your way and illumine our understanding. Send your spirit so that we will have the ears to hear what you are saying to your church. Amen. Our first reading today is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. Please listen now for God's word. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. And so they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give them, give him the produce at harvest time. And Jesus said, have you ever, have you never read in the scriptures that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces fruit for the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush on anyone on whom it falls. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables. They realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the gospel. 
Gospel reading this morning is a parable that finally ends up becoming an argument against the chief priests and the Pharisees. Jesus tells of a landowner, much like in Isaiah's uh, Old Testament reading, Isaiah had a friend who also built a vineyard and ended up with the same situation. So Jesus is not quoting Isaiah, but he's referring back. Israel was always considered to be God's vineyard. And so we know from the beginning, at least the Jews that were hearing it, knew from the beginning who Jesus was really talking about. These tenants decided to seize, torture, and murder the servants as they came to collect what really belonged to the landowner, his produce. Even when the owner sends his son, perhaps naively thinking that he will fare better than the slaves did, the evil tenants kill him too, hoping in vain to attain his inheritance. Now, I'm not much for renting property, but I know that any real estate agent or commercial property manager could probably explain today's gospel parable in two seconds flat. It's all about landlords and tenants and all the problems that happen between them. In Jesus' telling, the vineyard owner contracts with tenants for the use of his land. Then he promptly leaves for another town. At harvest time, the same land and owner expects to collect his rent, and so he sends his slaves to collect it, collect his share of the harvest from the tenants. But the tenants, they beat the first slave, kill a second, stone a third, and they do it all over again until finally they kill the landowner's son in the hope of somehow gaining his inheritance. What are we to make of this tale of violence and murder? At least, if the landowner here had some time to think, maybe he should have done a little more of a background check on these characters before renting them his vineyard, the very source of his livelihood. And these villains end up murdering his slaves and son. Surely in the ancient world, even the people there had some way of letting folks know when someone was good or bad. They had some way of getting references. And yes, that was before the internet. It could be done. The point of the story seems so obvious to Jesus' hearers that they leap at it with a moment, without a moment's hesitation. The landowner, they say, in moral out outrage, will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants. The aspects of this parable as an allegory are hard to miss. The landowner is God. The vineyard is Israel. Its leaders are the sharecroppers. The cruelly treated agents of the land are the Hebrew prophets and then Jesus himself. This parable teaches us as much about human nature as it does about thieves. The chief priests and the Pharisees have been in charge for quite some time but they quickly recognized themselves in what Jesus was saying. They at least begrudgingly admit to what he's saying and that these tenets should be punished, knowing even then that it was the Pharisees and the leaders that Jesus was talking about. He kind of cornered them. They wanted to arrest Jesus for his words. They wanted to get rid of him, but they knew they couldn't do it because the crowds would have torn him apart. And so reluctantly, and probably through clenched teeth, they admitted what Jesus was saying had to do with them. They answered his question, but again, the guilt was theirs. Jesus is trying to let us know how righteousness can quickly fall aside. It's a powerful message. Sometimes even we forget who we work for and who owns the vineyard. God will accomplish what God sets out to do. And so, Jesus tells them that even those things that were in your hands will be taken from you. God's going to take the kingdom from you and give it to someone else. Now, before you think I'm into one of those anti-Jewish rants, I'm not. God is simply telling them in this parable that because you're not doing what I want you to do, I'm going to remove that responsibility from you and leave you where you are and enlighten another group. And this is where Christianity comes in. We're supposed to be the enlightened group that God has put in charge of carrying his mission to the world in this time. The reason Jesus brings in about the cornerstone is because we don't want people to think that they have been replaced 
And those of you that did the Bible study with me this week, you got into all those Greek words. The Jews are not being replaced. They are simply not getting the message, and so they're going to be set aside for a time. God is not saying they will never be forgiven if they repent. There's still that opportunity. And the reason that it's important that Jesus is the cornerstone is because as the corner comes together, you have the Jews and the Christians, and together we give the message of God. We have to start from somewhere. No matter where we live or what we have, we're more than tenants in God's kingdom. We are God's call. But nothing ever truly belongs to us. In the final analysis, everything we have has been lent to us. Everything we have has been borrowed for a time. We are literally living on God's time, borrowed time for us. Like the priests and the Pharisees in this narrative, we might wish the world were different. The tenants wanted to be owners and the servants, they wanted to be masters. But that's not the way it is. The landowner erroneously says they will respect my son, and he concludes to decide to send his only child as an emissary after the slaves are beaten and killed. But it doesn't work out the way it should have. They kill him as well. Perhaps it would have been better if he had talked to someone like Dr. Phil and said, what do I do in this situation? And gotten some advice about, what's wrong with you? What are you thinking? Call the police. Start proceedings to get them off your property. And stay home. Lock the doors. Be safe. But God doesn't play safe with us. God takes the chance. God sends Jesus, and Jesus comes knowing that he's coming to die. But God somehow or other thinks tenants like us are worth coming after. The kingdom of God, Jesus says in the story, will be given to a people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. The fruit of the kingdom which Jesus speaks has nothing to do with grain or grains or dollars or cents, but our lives and the lives of the people that we contact. The kingdom is, in fact, ours, but only to the extent that we give it in turn to others, that we share it with others, lest we become like the Jewish Pharisees and share nothing and end up losing what God has given us. As with most of Jesus' teachings, there are clear answers, but they all come with a cost. They don't go down easily. As tenants, we have to remember that we don't own this. But we have been given a mission to share. Someone told me one time that the only thing you can take to heaven with you are those that follow you in. So no matter what you gain in this world, it's going to be left here when you leave. And of course, you know I like to talk to people about the scriptures that are coming up for the week. And I had a lady this week tell me that she tried to be Christian. She wanted to be the Christian that God wanted her to be, but she was afraid she was going to be found inadequate when judgment time came. Now, I know this woman personally, and I thought she was a saint already. But she thought other people felt the same as she did, that they would be lacking when God came to judge. Her whole faith was stymied by the idea that she should see numbers of people as she spoke to them. There should be numbers of people coming in. What the world does is it corrupts our mindset. The world tells us we should see numbers and finances. And God says, give them the message. And God is responsible for the answers. You don't have to browbeat someone into Christianity. Live it in front of them. They'll want what you have when they see what it does for you. Don't worry about getting into a, a Bible trivia game and not knowing it all, I lose them sometimes too. And I went through several years. But when it comes down to it, you don't have to know the written word, chapter and verse, as long as you know the word of God living within you. And that's what was missing with these tenants. They were busy keeping all the records and keeping everything in line, but they missed the spirit behind it. And for this lady that I was speaking of, 
it was only a matter of time until she caught on to the fact that God's kingdom doesn't run on the same economy that ours does. God gives us everything we need. When we read this story this morning, it said he set up a blind. He set up parameters, a fence. He set up a watchtower. He built a wine press. He had everything they needed to produce fruit and do what, was, what they were called to do. But they didn't do it. Instead, they tried to take what was not theirs. Which, when I think of it, seems like the silliest thing in the world. Because God says we are joint heirs with Christ. We will receive what Christ receives as a reward. So why try to take it ahead of time and lose it all? God views kingdom workers as partners, not just tenants. But the only way you get to know what a partner should be doing is to live the life of a tenant. To plant, to prune, to reach out. If you know anything about vines, and I don't know a lot, but when I was a kid, we bought a house where it had a good two acres of grape vines. And I thought it was going to be great. We could just go eat grapes whenever we wanted to. But it hadn't been tended in a long time. And believe me, those grapes were not edible. Now, we tried all we could. We made relish or out of them, and we made jelly, and we put as much sugar in them as you possibly could, but there was always that little tint of not quite right. God is calling us as tenants to tend those vines, to reach out to the people that need just a little bit of help or kind work, to do the job that he's asking us to do because God is everywhere, but sometimes we need a human touch. We need somebody that has been through it. We need someone who says that, yes, you're valuable. We need to hear it with our physical ears and see their love with our physical senses. So the stewardship question comes in here. Just what are we doing to tend the vines that God has given us? What are we doing to produce fruit? Are we working together with tenants and growers seeing the same thing, representing each other to the landowner to produce the best possible yield? Are we cultivating sweet grapes or have we left things go till we get acres of Sour Patch Kids type grapes? What are we doing? Are we looking at God's economy? of reaching out to each other, or are we so busy counting numbers and pennies and making sure we have enough for ourselves that we forget about others? First thing they told me when I realized I was called was to do God's work first, and God will take care of the rest. And God has been faithful to do that. But every time I decided that I didn't have enough or I needed to to do things this way, or I needed to keep more for me because I was panicking. One, I'm not listening to God and what God has directed me to do. And secondly, I'm not trusting God for what God said he would do. And so for me, at least, this whole sermon, this whole reading this morning, this whole parable, yes, there's wicked tenants, but there's also good tenants. And for me, this morning is about doing what God has asked us to do. We have a portion in this vineyard. We have an area that we're responsible for. And how are we reaching out? That's the concern. This morning, we will share communion together as part of World, World Communion Sunday. And in that aspect, we will share communion with all those in God's vineyard. I thought it was wonderful that somewhere it started at first thing this morning early in another area. And as hours go by and we go past the sun rising when it does come up, each hour gets closer to our area. So there has been communion going on from the beginning of this day and will continue throughout the day. What a wonderful thing to be part of. And perhaps once we are fed by Christ, 
we receive His body and blood, when we receive His presence, then we'll be sent out into the vineyard. God doesn't take anything to chance. He even strengthens us and teaches us before He sends us out. So as you receive communion this morning, remember it's not just communion with God and your brothers and sisters here, but it's a remembrance of all those who serve God everywhere. One family, one table, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, no matter where we come from or what language we speak, and then one calling to go out into the world and share the message of Christ. Amen. This is the affirmation of faith. Please say the Nicene Creed with me. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, According to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. This is the call for the offering. Christ reconciled us to God so that we might be one new humanity. Through this reconciliation comes the promise of peace. Let us give with an open heart to share this reconciliation of Christ throughout the world. Prayer of Dedication. Gracious God, you create and call us. Feed and sustain us. Forgive and redeem us. We can never return to you that which you deserve. We pray to honor and glorify you with these gifts and with our entire lives. We present this offering as a tangible way of showing our love for and loyalty to you. As tenants in your vineyard, we rejoice in being called to work with you in sharing your abundant harvest with the entire world you so love. Amen.
now to our time of communion. I ask that you all remain mindful and you will be served and do not move from your from your pews you will be taken. On this day around the world, the table has been set. And at this moment, we are one family, one table. Imagine the world seated with Christ at a sumptuous feast. Today we have a glimpse of what World Communion, by World Communion Sunday, of what it will be like when we finally come together in glory. The invitation to this table is for all. It is not the Lord's, it is the Lord's table, not the Presbyterian table. As long as you claim Christ as your Savior, you are welcome to share with us this morning. Now, Lord, let these gifts from your earth. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, become for us the communion of Christ for your people everywhere as they are shared throughout the world. One table for many, many giving glory to one God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O oh Lord our God, so much seems to be wrong with our vineyard. You gift us with space and work, fellow tenants and abundant harvest. But we often refuse to recognize the joy of your call and the beauty of your creation. We injure those you send to correct and restore us. We refuse to heed your life-giving call and even attempt to silence the word made flesh. Help us, Holy One, to treasure the gifts you give us, to tend the resources you entrust to us, and to work to heal the hurt we so readily inflict. You came to release captives and set all those who are oppressed free. You weep when your prophets are killed and your call to repent unheard. Grant us the courage to bring justice and peace. Make us the embodiments of your perfect love that casts out fear. O Lord our God, bring justice, bring peace to our world, and let only your voice be heard, not the voice of those who would bring division or hate, but only your love. O oh Lord our God, open our eyes to see you present, working to create a future where all your children are valued and respected, where all are fed and free to fulfill with joy your purpose for them. Give us the vision that enables us to enact your will. We ask this morning that you remember all those who stand in need of prayer. For all the lonely and those filled with anxiety or held captive, whether in body or mind. Those who feel despair, let them know your resurrection hope. For those who have been abused or those with medical concerns, bring healing in body, mind, and spirit. For those who stand on the front lines to keep us safe, for our military and first responders. For those facing also end of life issues and decisions. Let them all know your love and your safety. May we, your body of the church, be made one through the work of the Spirit to be the answer to prayer for your people. We make our prayer in gratitude for your grace and in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ the Son came to fulfill his Father's wishes. But on the night before he was betrayed, before his death, he sat at table one more time with his disciples. And as that supper proceeded, feeling and knowing what was about to come, he was concerned more for them than for himself. 
And so he took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks and praise. And he gave the cup to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ until we share this supper with him in glory. Come, for all has been made ready.
a little housekeeping. As you leave, there will be a receptacle for the plastic cups. I would ask that you each bring your own and dispose of them. Thank you. Let's pray our prayer after communion. Holy Triune God, we thank you for this meal that proclaims the peace and healing of the nations. We thank you for this meal where a little is enough to change our lives, where a little is more than enough to feed those who your heart yearn for communion in community. May this bread and the fruit of the vine nourish us so that we may grow in the faith and knowledge that in you we are one. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So now I charge you to go out into the world and do the work of the kingdom, proclaim the peace that passes all understanding, saying all the good news of the gospel that has been given to you this day. And now may God's blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend on each of you and remain in peace and power forever. Go to do the work of the Lord. Amen. Yes.